Okay, okay, okay. Um, got your shea butter? Check. All right. How about your dashiki? You know it, bro. And your hotep manual. Did you bring that? You know what, King? Oh man. I'm squad, so what you gonna do? Spinning with my family, chill with the crew. We gon' share gifts. You don't have to spend loot. We celebrate culture, our African roots. This quad, so what you gon' do? Spinning with my family, chill with the crew. With the we gon' share gifts. You don't have to spend loot. We celebrate culture, our African roots. On December 26, goodbye Saint Nick. I light a black candle. Look, ooh, it's lit. First day of Kwanzaa, Umoja means unity. Ain't messing with my clique, melanated, check the drip. So, 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 self determination is the mantra. Uh, Constant elevation like the Haitians when they conquered their colonizers. Yeah. Like a real life Wakanda, true believers. Day two, that's Kuji Chakulia. Uh, Ujima, day three, responsibility. Let's put in that work together, buy the block, clean the streets. Collectively connected like the constellations. Plant a seed, watch it grow, reap what Spend you your sow. black dollars on black business. Your black descendants, they hustle for your black children, a black trillion, that's how much black spending, Ujama economics is how blacks will win, Lord willing. On the fifth day of Kwanzaa with my family, Nia means purpose, build our legacy, rest in peace, Rebecca Jones, matriarchy, continue to work, Fannie Lou Hamer passed to me. Uh. Hey, Kuwumba, yeah, you know what that means, creativity, and you know what that brings, full pockets, yeah, you know I like greens, I get paid every time I write things, and my inner life beams. Day seven, all the candles lit on a Kanara. Imani means faith in a better tomorrow. Joy over sorrow. Equity over equal. The kids are our future leaders. We believe in all our people. But well, black women shape the human race. Meet your maker. Queen mother, we appreciate. You are sacred. You are Harriet. You are Ella Baker. You are a maker. You are a manifester. A creator. This one, so what you gonna do? What you gonna spend with my family. Chill with the crew. With the we gon' share gifts. You don't have to spend loot. We celebrate culture. Our African roots. This quad, so what you gon' do? Spend it with my family, chill with the crew. We gon' share gifts, you don't have to spend loot. We celebrate culture, our African roots. Thank you for watching. You can go print out my free Kwanzaa worksheet on my website, fuge.com slash class. It's perfect for your classroom or for your home if you're homeschooling. So make sure you go get that. And if you want to fill it out with me right now, you can pause this video and go print it off. So once you have your worksheet, you're going to need a pencil or a pen, and you're going to need a green and red crayon coloring pencil or marker. You have everything you need. All right, let's get started. So Kwanzaa is a seven day festival from December 26th to January 1st, and each day represents a different principle. So we light a new candle on the Kanara every day to represent that principle. Seven days, seven principles, seven candles. So let's start with day one, December 26th, write Umoja, and that means unity. After you write that, color in that number one candle black. Day two, December 27th, you're gonna write Kuji Chagulia, that means self-determination. Believing in yourself, making decisions for yourself. Color in that day two candle red. Day three, December 28th, write Ujima. That means collective work and responsibility. Building our community and helping each other solve problems. Color in that number three candle green. Day four, December 29th, write Ujama. That means cooperative economics. Buying from black owned businesses and keeping the money in our own communities. Color the fourth candle red. Day five, December 30th, write Nia. That means purpose. It's also about building our community and restoring our legacy from our proud history. Color in that fifth candle green. Day six, December 31st, write Kaumba. That means creativity, using our talents to make our communities in this world a better place. You know what to do. Color in that sixth candle red. And finally, day seven, write Imani. It means faith, faith in each other that we'll be victorious in our struggle. So that's it. When you finish your worksheet, it should look a little bit like this. Make sure you color the flames at the top of the candles and even the base of the Kanara and get as creative as you would like. I'm sure you noticed all of the Kwanzaa principles are in another language, Kiswahili. So now you can brag to your friends that you know a little bit of Swahili. So happy Kwanzaa and happy holidays. Until next time, peace, love, and shabam. F-Y-U-T-C-H. Hello, future. 
Assalamu alaikum, greetings of peace. My name is Shafia Mbalia. I am the Southern Regional Coordinator of the Imam Jamil Action Network. Welcome to the Freedom Fighters Film Festival. The Freedom Fighters Film Festival is a coordinated showing of videos, audios, and panel discussions taking place across the South, centered around key Black liberation human rights strategists and influencers, Fannie Lou Hamer, Imam Jamil el formerly known as H. Rat Brown, Ms. Ella Baker, and Malcolm X, al Haj Malik El-Shabazz. For those of you who may not know, Imam Jamil Abdullah al is the wrongfully convicted Imam and human rights leader, formerly known as H. Rat Brown, fifth chairman of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. We'll take you this Kwanzaa 2022 to six locations across the South with organizations fighting against injustices and oppression and for human rights and self-determination. New Orleans, Louisiana, Birmingham, Alabama, Atlanta, Georgia, Acadia, Florida, Spartanburg, South Carolina, and Greenville, North Carolina. Each team will show you through movie clips, panels, and documentary, their version of the commonality of the conditions of the national black community grounded in the U.S. South, part of the Global South. The Freedom Fighters Film Festival is designed to show our common condition. It will also expose, in these perilous times, the backlash that we have always faced, this time in the form of the FBI's counterintelligence program, or COINTELPRO, back in the day, as well as today. We'll lift up some of our freedom fighters who have stood and still stand as political prisoners against it. Before we hand you to our Greenville, North Carolina team, we light the fourth day of Kwanzaa. The candle today is for Ujima, collective work and responsibility. After that, the next voices you hear will be that of Askari Wawatu and Denisha Rogers, co-moderators of the program. Again, on behalf of the Imam Jamil Action Network, in collaboration with PANIC, Ubuntu Institute, Transform Alabama, Mapinduzi, Muslims for Social Justice, Malcolm X Center for Self-Determination, Bar None by Design, the Action Alliance, and Jamatul Asr, thank you for joining the Freedom Fighters Film Festival. So what's good, y'all? My name is uh, Yusuf Askari Wawatu. I'm out of Greenville, North Carolina, representing, uh, uh, representing Malcolm Doozy. Um, today we have a program today. We want to show y'all a couple of films. Uh, we're going to have some of our panelists and speakers. I'm going to be real powerful to be, you know what I'm saying? And uh, Habari Ghani, you know, so we're Jimmy the third day of Kwanzaa. And um, for our first film, we have uh, the story of American poverty. Poverty in America is not a new problem, but the extent of the issue has seldom been brought to the attention of the entire world. That's exactly what happened recently when the United Nations Special Rapporteur took a tour of some of America's poorest places and reported back about what he found. NewsHour Weekend Special Correspondent Simon Ostrowski has our story, which was supported in part by a grant from the Pulitzer Center on Crisis Reporting. This report is part of our ongoing series about poverty and opportunity in America. Chasing the Dream. This is Philip Alston, the United Nations point man on poverty. His job usually involves visiting the world's least developed countries. But earlier this month, Alston flipped the script. My report demonstrates that growing inequality and widespread poverty, which afflicts almost one child out of every five, has deeply negative implications for the enjoyment of civil and political rights. The country he's talking about might not be what you'd expect. It's the United States of America, and his criticism, made to the United Nations Council on Human Rights, goes much, much further. 
The United States has the highest income inequality in the Western world, and this can only be made worse by the massive new tax cuts overwhelmingly benefiting the wealthy. Just days before Alston delivered his report, the United States had pulled out of the UN Human Rights Council, claiming it was stacked against US ally Israel and refused to be reformed. For too long, the Human Rights Council has been a protector of human rights abusers and a cesspool of political bias. American ambassador to the UN, Nikki Haley, reacted to Alston's report with a strongly worded letter, calling the report misleading, politically motivated, and biased. She said it was patently ridiculous for the UN even to examine poverty in the wealthiest and freest country in the world. But Alston's report to the UN not only implied that US policies towards poverty ignored human rights, but as a result, democracy itself is being steadily undermined. How did you conceive of the idea to come to the United States? The United States has long opposed the notion that there is any such thing as uh, social human rights. The United States has for decades now stood up and said, no, 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 there's no right to food. We think it's a good idea if people get access to food, but it's not a human right. What Alston does want people to embrace is his belief that extreme poverty is a human rights issue and governments have an obligation to alleviate it. But that's a controversial idea. Well, I think it's a complicated question. Keith Harper was President Barack Obama's last ambassador to the UN Human Rights Council. I don't think I would go fully on board with a special rapporteur's position. Having said that, I think the way these problems often manifest in the United States could be human rights violation. If, for example, they're rooted in disparate treatment between, say, African Americans and, and, and white Americans, then you have a violation of the Convention on Racial Discrimination. Disparate treatment is what Alston says he found. I note with regret that United States Ambassador Nikki Haley has characterized this council as a cesspool and has chosen to withdraw from it just days before my presentation. Speaking of cesspools, my report draws attention to those I witnessed in Alabama as part of his poverty tour, Alston visited Lowndes County, where the Halcombs live just yards away from their town's wastewater lagoon. The irony is their entire African-American neighborhood isn't connected to the sewer system the lagoon serves, and they rely on their own faulty septic tank. There are no white people they have nowhere around in this poor, all the way back to 21. It's all black. Your front yard looks like a lake. He looked worse than that yesterday. When it rains, the rest of the town's waste backs up into the Halcombs' yard. They need to get that sewage off and over here. It shouldn't be in this neighborhood. I hear that. This is sewer. Okay, that must be where it's seeping through this sewer here. So if you're trying to figure out why the United Nations felt that they had to send somebody down to Alabama, this is the reason, open sewage bubbling up from the ground from a pipe and just coming and flooding into people's yards. The authorities in Alabama brought sewage systems to affluent, primarily white neighborhoods decades ago. But roughly half of the homes in this mostly African-American county either don't have any septic system at all or their systems are failing, according to Catherine Flowers, a local activist who conducted a survey of nearly 3,000 homes. These are classic third world conditions in the richest country in the world. It makes absolutely no sense. And of the 2,800 houses that were surveyed, what percentage had adequate sewage facilities? Most of them, at least 50% of the people that we surveyed had failing systems or no systems at all. What's it like living uh, without a septic tank system? It's bad. And I don't like to see this, you know, stuff running out on the ground like this. Pamela Rush is also a resident here. So how does it work? It's just a scrape pipe run out from the house. How come you don't have a septic tank? I could never afford a septic tank. Mm -hmm. It was like this ever since I've been here. Okay, how long has that been? Yeah, over 20 years. So the government actually doesn't consider it its responsibility to provide the infrastructure for getting rid of waste? No, I mean, they will say, look, we've got laws on the books, uh, and if you have a house, it's your responsibility. 
But of course, the bottom line is that there's an awful lot of people, not just poor people, ordinary people, who could never afford a sanitation system. They don't re recognize that they need to be Alabama's chief health officer, Dr. Scott Harris, told us the state has never conducted a survey to assess the scope of the problem. How many households would you say uh, don't have proper sewage facilities? Far too many, although we don't have great data on that. Um, we have uh, made efforts in the past to try to count those numbers, but we, we don't have a way that we're confident that we're collecting all that information. Um, in Lowndes County, um, for example, we think those numbers could be, you know, maybe 20%, you know, or, or it could be significantly higher or it might be lower, but, but we know that a substantial number of the population. When we interviewed Philip Alston, he told us that he got the sense that the local authorities didn't feel it was their responsibility, and not only that, they didn't know how big an issue it was because they'd never conducted a survey. I don't know about every person that he, that he spoke with, um, but Clearly, it's an issue. We've identified it as an issue, and we've tried to educate local people on how important it is. So. Do you think there's a problem where you see the better off white part of town um, being connected to the sewer system and the poorer, worse off black part of town not being connected to the system here in Lowndes County? There's a clear racial disparity here. I mean, there's, there's no question about it. I think people who are impoverished of any color, but particularly African American people who are impoverished, lack the so social capital to be able to get their problems addressed. They, they are unable to get government to answer to them in the way that people who are more well off or have better connections can do. We asked Nikki Haley's spokesperson at the mission to the UN to speak to NewsHour Weekend about Alston's report. He didn't respond to calls and emails. Nikki Haley said it's patently ridiculous for the United Nations to be uh, reviewing poverty in a country as rich as the United States. Do you agree with that? I don't agree with that. I think that uh, countries like the United States, where we have incredible wealth, uh, are precisely the kinds of countries uh, where if you do have poverty, you want to find out about it because we have the resources to address it. In the case of Alabama, the challenge of providing proper waste treatment to all citizens may finally be getting addressed with proposed bipartisan legislation, in part due to the attention Alston's visit brought. And in this day and age, everyone should have access to quality, affordable wastewater systems. Alongside Republican legislators Mike Rogers and Shelley Capito, Democratic Congresswoman Terry Sewell and Democratic Senators Doug Jones and Cory Booker have introduced bipartisan bills in the House and Senate that, if passed, will offer federal assistance to households for sanitation systems. How does that make Alabamans feel that the United Nations felt they needed to send somebody who they usually send to third world countries to this state? Well, you know, look, it really doesn't matter how they feel. What we've got to do is take that report and say, look, this is a problem. Don't shoot the messenger. That's what we say down here in the South. Just don't shoot the messenger. Let's take the message and try to build on it and work on it. Well, what would you say to people um, who would argue that our tax dollars should be spent on improving um, our own and our children's lives instead of uh, people who haven't been able to sort their own situation out? Well, I think what any community does is to acknowledge that there are losers in life or people who have gone through disasters. It can happen to any of us, but those of us who are well off have safety nets, either personal or familial or whatever. These people don't have those safety nets. It's a basic uh, tenet of decency for a society to pr make basic provision for the poorest and most vulnerable members of its society. Uh, yeah, so um, after that we have um, another speaker, my name is Daydon Wawakiri, who's also a muffin doozy out here in Greenville, North Carolina, and he's going to speak on some of the things that um, we face out here in Eastern North Carolina, and we have uh, Denisha as well, we're going to discuss some of um, just the ongoing uh, state violence that goes on against Black people in our way of poverty and uh, policing in our communities. Yeah, greetings, Conrad. <clears throat> um, my name is Dayan Wawa Kerry. Uh, I live in Greenville, North Carolina, along with my comrade right here, Nisha. Um, and yeah, no, we're part of Mark and Um, We are very appreciative to be a part of this Kwanzaa celebration. I think it's important 
they all, that we always, you know, come together um, to, you know, really take the time and the opportunity to, you know, review our history, you know, and go over the things that, you know, put us in this position or brought us to the place that we are in right now. Um, but yeah, no, we started on um, Mock and Doozy in Greenville around 2020 after the death of George Floyd. And um, it was around the time when there was no, I would say, real strong presence of organization in the area. So uh, we developed an organization that really spoke to a lot of the conditions that we even heard about um, um, in the video that we just looked at when it comes to poverty, gentrification, a lack of resources, an overwhelming amount of police uh, terror and uh, occupational presence in our communities. So uh, Mapinduzi was, uh, you know, formed by, you know, a, a, a group of young black, you know, people who was already a part of an organization um, before Mapinduzi was formed. And um, <clears throat> with that, you know, we started to challenge a lot of the structural issues uh, in Greenville, North Carolina, and really started to bring on uh, the community, a lot of the working class and what people consider, you know, uh, the underclass in our society. So a lot of the people like uh, in those, you know, areas started to uh, develop a voice and an understanding uh, that really went against the traditional, you know, type of uh, 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 black radical work in the city. <clears throat> so, um, you know, I think um, it's important always to note that uh, organization is one of the things that is needed in this time, wherever we are. You know, uh, if there's not already an organization in, you know, your area, it's important that you try to develop your own, you know, going through the lessons of those who came before us, you know, like the Black Panther Party um, and other parties that existed that kind of paved the way and gave us a blueprint on how to, uh, uh, I would say, um, correctly uh, combat an overwhelming system that we face today. So uh, with that, <clears throat> um, there comes a whole lot of, state repression and my Penduzi, uh was uh, a part of that state repression around uh, 2020 2021 i myself was uh arrested and charged with uh, inciting a riot and some other charges and i uh, got interviewed i was interviewed by uh the state they asked me all type of questions they asked me uh questions about things that i know you know they had no idea about if it wasn't for you know you know, the larger systems that play, you know, a lot of, uh, you know, questions was uh, centered around the organizational work that I do. Um, they asked me, you know, things about people who uh, uh, I associate with. And so this attack <clears throat> was uh, something new, you know, uh, to me, you know, and uh, something new to our movement here in Greenville, North Carolina. And if it wasn't for uh, Mark and Doozy being connected, to uh, so many other organizations, some uh, new and some, uh, you know, who have been around for a while that had the lessons of how to really deal with state repression, how to organize within it, how to combat uh, uh, a lot of the things that was happening at the time. And those, that is the most important thing, I think, that uh, really uh, helped, you know, my producers and helped my case was being a part of an organization inside of organizations. Um, so it's just always important to understand that, you know, organization is the, the key thing for colonized people in our country moving forward, you know. And when we look at Kwanzaa, I mean, you know, of course, we, we celebrate uh, the points of unity and everything like that. But we also, you know, try to revive the cultural revolution, the black radical tradition that even, you know, brought this thing to be. You see what I'm saying? And uh, that is, that is, I think, the approach that we have to move forward with moving forward in the new year is that, um, you know, the objective is and still remains to organize uh, and resist for a new uh, social structure. And, you know, we appreciate that. So um, we can start with you today, Don, and then we can go to you, Denisha, um, if y'all want to speak about your cases and the area in which the uh you know you face state repression like you know the exact neighborhoods and things of that nature and how that uh how you know it's just a, uh, an assault on the black community by occupation of course i'm sorry can you repeat that again yeah if you, um then uh, you can start then denisha you start and just speak on the specific settings where y'all um face some police violence and like state violence and police repression 
speak on the area, like as it pertains to the black community and things of this nature? Yeah, so um, <clears throat> Mapinduzi does a lot of work inside of uh, West Greenville and South Greenville, which is uh, two areas that are um, majority black and uh, are primarily targeted uh, when it comes to law enforcement. It is the areas that are, you know, lack of resources. And then just like any other majority black community, impoverished community in the U.S., you know, it's just like any other one of those. So um, we do a lot of uh, work and organizing around there to try to, you know, really uh, bring about a, uh, you know, a new cultural way of trying to uh, combat a system. But um, I think um, that's, that's, you know, that's what makes Mapinduzi, you know, Mapinduzi is that, you know, we have the ability because a lot of the people inside of Mapinduzi come from, you know, uh, working class communities, come from communities that are being, you know, the hood and things like that. So we had that uh, availability to go inside and have those conversations. We also had that availability to go inside and really gain an understanding and gain a, a, an approach on how to, you know, interact with, you know, uh, you know, our people in these areas. And with that comes, you know, the state repression because, you know, the state knows very well that when we involve the black working class, when we involve, you know, the black underclass into a black radical struggle, people who, you know, normally already have an uncompromising position against the system anyway, because they're constantly, you know, in and out of the system, then that kind of like, you know, puts, in our view, puts, you know, uh, the position in the new game um, field. So um, I think, you know, um, you know, with that, you know, comes the state. Mm -hmm. Yeah, most definitely. Yeah, um Nisha, you want to speak on your case and, uh, you know, the, just, I guess for me knowing, you know, about your case too, just speak on uh, how the police just attacked you and assaulted you and some of the uh, bogus charges they gave you. Um, back in August, uh, August 31st of this year, I was pulled for having dead um, tags and registration. My tags were not dead. Car wasn't expired. Um, when he pulled me, he didn't even have time to really, you know, run your tags. He just jumped out. I'm talking about, they came from everywhere. It was like 10 police on me and my daughter and another female cousin. And I'm like, what's wrong? He was like, get out the car. I'm asking, what's wrong? Uh, get out the car. What is wrong? Why are y'all on me on this? He was like, okay, snatching me out the car. The third time I heard my bones break. My he broke two of my fingers. Um, I ended up having to get three screws in this one, two in that one, and he slammed me on the ground, took me to jail for resisting public officer. Never charged me with any type of driving citation or or gave me a ticket or anything, but they charged me with resisting public officer. Um, with that, it's been challenge after challenge. Um, attacks, different attacks, methods they use, harassing my children. My children can't even go outside um, without the police pulling up on them or um, just it's getting to the point where I, I feel like I am being removed out of the community that I've been a part of all my life. 34 years of life I've been in and I can't beat them. It's and being part of organizations such as Mop and Doozy and others I'm a part of has given me a place where I don't, I'm not alone or um, I don't have to go up against them by myself. Um, resources on um, how to handle these type of situations. So I say to anybody, now this is the week of Kwanzaa. A lot of people take this time to Plan for the new year. Uh, this was the time when our ancestors gathered and they did things to prosper for the new year. It is time to plan how we're going to handle these situations. This is time to stand together. This is time to join together and hold these people accountable for their actions and, and get things done in our community so we can live here too. It's almost making it like this is not a community for black people anymore. Um, they're gentrifying everything. It's a lot of people right now facing homeless and evictions because 
they have took these houses that were once our houses made a rent three times uh, what it used to be. It's rent eighteen fifty two thousand dollars. I can't name five people that really make two times that rent. Five thousand a month, six thousand a month. So it's putting a lot of our people in jeopardy with their children to be homeless in the middle of our coldest winter I've seen in a long time. This is time where it's something that has to be done. The organizations have to come together. The communities, black communities, brown communities, have to come on and stand up and fight. So 2023, I challenge everybody to fight. There's real words from the comrade right there. And as you can see, just like the film we discussed, um, that's, that's American poverty for you, you know, that's... Uh, they rather police us and harass us and keep us in cages and then just really kick us out of our homes rather than, uh, you know, create programs and things of that nature. And that's why a day like today for Kwanzaa with Jima's is important. Because, you know, that's, that's collective work. You know, understand what I'm saying? And, uh, you know, I appreciate you, Daydon and Denisha, for those words. Y'all got anything else y'all want to um, add or shout out before we move on to the next thing? Nah, just um, you know, on social media, um, Nisha has a uh, drop the charges on Denisha. Was Denisha right? Justice for De Just, Justice yeah. for Nisha, yeah. N I S H A, and um, it has a the petition that we asked everyone to sign. Uh, change that whole petition up there in ways that you can donate and help the situation. Yeah, so we just run the numbers up, you know, just support the comrade. You know, yeah, we appreciate y'all again. Real, um, okay, and then moving on to our next film we have, we have, uh, Malcolm X. Who taught you to hate your own kind? Who taught you to hate the race that you belong to? So much so that you don't want to be around each other. You know, before you come asking Mr. Muhammad, does he teach hate? You should ask who yourself, who taught you to hate being what God gave you. How did one man go from petty criminal to becoming a global voice against racism? He's one of the most prominent Muslims in modern history and a symbol of black liberation who has inspired generations. A gangster, a preacher, and a revolutionary, this is the extraordinary journey of Malcolm X. Malcolm X was born in 1925 in Omaha, Nebraska. His parents, Earl and Louise Little, were followers of the Pan-African activist Marcus Garvey. As a result, their family was subjected to constant harassment by the Ku Klux Klan, who burned down their home when Malcolm was just four years old. The family moved to Michigan, where they were threatened by the Black Legion, an offshoot of the KKK. Four of Malcolm's uncles were also murdered by white racists. Malcolm's father died when he was six. The incident was officially ruled a street car accident, although his mother believed he had ultimately been murdered by the Black Legion. When Malcolm was 13, his mother was committed to a mental institution. Her children were split up and sent to different foster homes. Malcolm was an excellent student, but dropped out of school after a white teacher told him it was unrealistic for a young black boy to have aspirations of being a lawyer. After a few years in Michigan and Boston, he moved to Harlem at the age of 18, where he was involved in gambling, robbery, drug dealing, and pimping. At the age of 21, after committing a string of robberies with a small gang in Boston, Malcolm was arrested and sentenced to 8 to 10 years at Charlestown State Prison. Incarceration was the beginning of Malcolm's transformation. While in prison, his siblings began writing to him about the Nation of Islam and its leader, Elijah Muhammad. The Nation of Islam promoted black independence and rejected the notion of the superiority of white people. Instead, Elijah Muhammad taught his followers a form of separatism from whites, who were actually considered devils, inferior to black people who were the original inhabitants of Earth. Malcolm, initially hostile to the idea of any religion, eventually became a member of the nation. He read books constantly and began writing regularly to Elijah Muhammad. Muhammad's followers were taught to abandon their given family names as they were actually the names of former slave owners. So Malcolm Little became Malcolm X. After being paroled, Malcolm visited Elijah Muhammad in Chicago. In June the next year, he was named Assistant Minister of the Nation of Islam's Temple No. 1 in Detroit. He later established Boston's Temple No. 11 and expanded Temple No. 12 in Philadelphia. And those of you who think that you perhaps came here to hear us tell you to turn the other cheek to the brutality of the white man. I say again, you came to the wrong place. <laughs> Finally, he was selected to lead Temple Number no. 7 in Harlem, where he was responsible for a huge surge in membership. We don't teach you to turn the other cheek. <laughs> <laughs> 
We don't teach you to turn the other cheek in the south, and we don't teach you to turn the other cheek in the north. We teach you to obey the law. We teach you to carry yourselves in, in a respectable way. But at the same time, we teach you that anyone who puts his hand on you, do your best to see that he doesn't put it on anybody else. The FBI now had him under surveillance due to his sudden profile as the nation's rising star. Malcolm's rise to national prominence happened in 1957, when he intervened at a police station to arrange for medical assistance and legal help for members of the nation who had been beaten and arrested by New York police. The crowd of protesters outside grew to almost 4,000. Witnessing Malcolm's control of the crowd shook the New York Police Department. Within weeks, they had him under surveillance and officially began infiltrating the nation. In 1958, Malcolm married his wife Betty, with whom he would have six daughters. Malcolm's profile continued to grow via print and television appearances, and he began to gain international exposure. Who is it that controls the prostitution in Harlem? It's the white man. Who controls the large nut sale of whiskey and wine? It's the white man. Who gives you the deck of cards and the dice that you use to gamble with? It's the white man. And after he sell them to you, he kept you with him and put you in jail for using them. He was deeply critical of the growing civil rights movement and its leaders, like Dr. Martin Luther King, who preached integration. That's what you mean by nonviolent. Be defenseless. Be defenseless in the face of one of the most cruel uh, beasts that has ever taken the people into captivity. That's this American white man. A uh, hundred years ago, they used to put on a white sheet and use a bloodhound against Negroes. Today, they have taken off the white sheet and put on police uniforms. They've uh, traded in the bloodhounds for police dogs, and they're still doing the same thing. And just as Uncle Tom, back during slavery, used to keep the Negroes from resisting the bloodhound or resisting the Ku Klux Klan by teaching them to, to love their enemy. Uh, Luther King is just a 20th century or modern Uncle Tom or a religious Uncle Tom who is doing the same thing today. To Malcolm's message was being heard louder than ever, but his relationship with the man who had transformed his life was about to fracture. Tensions were growing within the nation over the amount of attention Malcolm was receiving compared to his mentor, Elijah Muhammad. An unprovoked raid on a Nation of Islam mosque by police in Los Angeles led to one member being paralyzed and another being killed. No charges were laid against the police. The white man believes you when you go to him with that old sweet talk, because you've been sweet talking him ever since he brought you here. Stop sweet talking. Tell him how you feel. Tell him how what kind of hell you've been catching, and let him know that if he's not ready to clean his house up, if he's not ready to clean his house up, he shouldn't have a house should catch on fire and burn down. Malcolm was reportedly stunned by Elijah Muhammad's refusal to allow any form of response or retaliation for the incident. The two also disagreed over Malcolm's desire to begin working with civil rights organizations, black politicians, and other religious organizations. Then, suddenly, here is a bulletin from CBS News. Three shots were fired at President Kennedy's motorcade in downtown Dallas. President Kennedy has been seriously wounded. Malcolm's response to the Kennedy assassination led to him being officially silenced for 90 days. Malcolm X, you were involved in a controversy some months ago with your leader. Is that over? Well, I've been, I've been silenced for the past 90 days because of uh, some statements I made concerning the President of the United States. Uh, which were distorted. They were distorted. And, yes, and, what did you say, and, Malcolm? Well, I said the same thing that everybody says, that uh, his assassination was the result of the climate of hate. But only, I, only, only I said the chickens came home to roost, and, which means the same thing. In March of 1964, Malcolm publicly announced his break from the Nation of Islam. He also expressed a desire to work with other civil rights leaders, saying that Elijah Muhammad had prevented him from doing so. Then came a bombshell. Well, in reality, I never even left the Muslim movement. They put me out. And they put me out because of what I knew. And what I knew was told to me by Mr. Muhammad's son, uh, Wallace Muhammad himself. They put me out and they put him out. Who is the father of all of these various children whom you have enumerated? Uh, the first one to tell me who the father was was Wallace Muhammad. And he told me that the father was Elijah Muhammad himself. One of and how many of these illegitimate children did he father with the sisters? Well, he made uh, six sisters pregnant. They all had children. Two of those six had two children. I am told that there is a seventh sister who is supposed to be in Mexico right now, and she's supposed to be having a child by him. Are you not, perhaps, afraid of what might happen to you as a result of making these revelations? Oh, yes. I probably am a dead man already. 
After splitting from the nation, Malcolm began learning the tenets and practices of Sunni Islam. He founded the Muslim Mosque Incorporated, a religious organization, and the Organization of Afro-American Unity, a non-religious group promoting Pan-Africanism. He had softened his position on Martin Luther King, who he met only once in person. And later the same year, he performed Hajj, the Muslim pilgrimage to Mecca. This was to be yet another transformative experience for him. When I was in on the pilgrimage, I had close contact with Muslims whose skin would in America be classified as white, and with Muslims who themselves would be classified as white in America. But these particular Muslims didn't call themselves white. They looked upon themselves as human beings, as part of the human family, and therefore they looked upon all other segments of the human family as part of that same family. Now, uh, they had a different look or a different air or a different attitude than that which is uh, reflected in the uh, attitude of the man in America who calls himself white. So I said that if uh, Islam had done this, done that for them, perhaps if the white man in America would study Islam, perhaps it could do the same thing for him. After Mecca, Malcolm made two trips to Africa, meeting officials and speaking on radio and television across the continent. In Cairo, he attended the second meeting of the Organization of African Unity and met Africa's most high-profile leaders, including Kwame Nkrumah of Ghana, Gamal Abdel Nasser of Egypt, and Ahmed Ben Bella of Algeria, who all offered him official positions in their respective governments. He met with Fidel Castro and was one of the first African-American leaders to meet the newly created Palestinian Liberation Organization, and was one of the pioneers of a tradition of black Palestinian solidarity that would be continued by the Black Panther Party and the Black Lives Matter movement. A common misconception about Malcolm's philosophical evolution is that his process of turning to Sunni Islam softened his political positions. While it's true that Malcolm abandoned some of the nation's more extreme separatist positions on race, he remained a staunch black nationalist. I think what a lot of people are interested in, Malcolm, is whether this experience has made you feel that that your feelings have changed, that, uh, that the animosity you have expressed in the past toward all fights. And there's one the thing that I want to make cl clear. No matter how much respect, no matter how much uh, uh, recognition whites show toward me, as far as I'm concerned, as long as that same respect and recognition is not shown toward every one of our people in this country, it doesn't exist for me. If anything, Malcolm's travel had led him to globalize his perspective, seeing black liberation as something beyond the United States, and as something that was intimately tied to struggles for independence across the third world. It has remained a domestic problem. It has remained within the jurisdiction of the United States. And it has, and as such, it has been impossible for the Afro-Americans or American Negroes to try and enlist the support of other dark-skinned uh, people who are being oppressed the world over in, in that struggle. And the only way this can be done is by internationalizing the problem. If you take up arms, you'll end it. But if you sit around and wait for the one who's, who's in power to make up his mind that he should end it, you'll be waiting a long time. And in my opinion, the young generation of whites, blacks, brown, whatever else there is, you're living at a time of extremism, a time of revolution, a time when there's got to be a change. The Nation of Islam had not taken Malcolm's exit and public criticism of Elijah Muhammad's misconduct lightly. His family was repeatedly threatened, their car was bombed, and FBI surveillance records show that law enforcement was aware that elements within the nation were openly discussing his death. Then his house was burned down. On February 21st, 1965, Malcolm was addressing the Organization of Afro-American Unity in Manhattan's Audubon Ballroom. He was shot 21 times. Three Nation of Islam members were tried and convicted of the murder, but questions remained. At the time of his death, Malcolm was under surveillance by both the NYPD and the FBI's COINTELPRO operation. For many, there is simply no doubt that one or both organizations had a hand in his assassination. Malcolm's legacy went on to be preserved in hip-hop, film and literature. Most importantly, his own autobiography, which continues to be celebrated and was named one of the 10 most influential non-fiction books of the 20th century. His politics continue to inspire generations of activism against racism and imperialism worldwide. People in power have misused it, and now there has to be a change and a better world has to be built, and the only way it's going to be built is with extreme methods. And I, for one, will join in with anyone, don't care what color you are, 
as long as you want to change this miserable condition that exists on this earth. Thank you. Malcolm's funeral was held in Harlem. Some estimate that up to 30,000 people attended. Actor and activist Ozzy Davis delivered the eulogy. Harlem has come to bid farewell to one of its brightest hopes, extinguished now and gone from us forever. Many will ask what Harlem finds to honor in this stormy, controversial, and bold young captain, and we will smile. Many will say, turn away, away from this man, for he is not a man, but a demon, a monster, a subverter, and an enemy of the black man. And we will answer and say unto them, did you ever talk to Brother Malcolm? Did you ever touch him? Or have him smile at you? Did you ever really listen to him? Malcolm was our manhood, our living black manhood. This was his meaning to his people. And in honoring him, we honor the best in ourselves. What we place in the ground is no more now a man, but a seed, which after the winter of discontent will come forth again to meet us, and we shall know him then for what he was and is, a prince, our own black shining prince, who did not hesitate to die because he loved us so. You now use Shabazz and drop X? I'll probably continue to use Malcolm X because, and I'll probably use it as long as the situation that produced it exists. <laughs> Moving forward, next up we have uh, Ibrahim Abdullah. He's a member of the Imam. Jamil Action Network, a long-time supporter and a follower of Imam Jamil's leadership and advocate for political prisoners. He's also a father and a grandfather who lives in Cleveland, Ohio. Good to have you on. Good to be here, bro. I appreciate it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, um, first and foremost, I'd like to thank you all for, you know, allowing me to, to be part of this platform. You know, um, what we're doing in terms of with the Imam Jamil Action Network, uh, we, we're in a struggle right now to, first and foremost, to free Imam Jamil out of me. We also support other political prisoners and in general, just the, the liberation of our people. Um, for those who don't know Imam Jamil out of me, formerly known as H. Rod Brown, H. Rod Brown is, is a rather historical figure. And when most people ask about H. Rod Brown, they don't know that Imam Jamil Alameen and H. Rod Brown are the same person. In fact, many people think that Imam Jamil or that H. Rod Brown had died, and they don't even know that, that Imam Jamil and H. Rod Brown are the same person. But just a little background on Imam Jamil. He was, um, he was born in 1943, October 4th, 1943, in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Um, he became active at a very young age. He led a, a student... Uh, walk out at the age of 15 in his high school. Um, and it was in solidarity with the walkout uh, in Southern University. The college was his, which his older brother attended, his brother Ed Brown attended. So um, his brother was expelled from, from Southern University because of his leadership and his activism within the community. So he decided to move to Washington, DC. And eventually he enrolled in uh, Howard University and Imam Jamil, at the time was known was his birth name was Hubert Gerald Brown. He uh would go to Washington, DC to visit his brother. So there he de he developed and became more politically educated. And his activism really grew and he matured in a way to where he became a natural leader. So he um by like 1964, he was involved in an organization called the Nonviolent Action Group. And this organization actually was a predator. I mean, the, the, I'm sorry, not a predator, but a pre, a pre, uh, uh, the, the pre existence to, to SNCC. 
the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, just like in the video that you just shared. But it, it was um, it was that group that that they had taken up to to listen to Malcolm, one that trip to who took a trip to New York City, SNCC, which uh, Imam Jamil was part of the the group that preceded that that would e eventually become SNCC. So he was part of the the, the nonviolent action group in Washington D.C. Um, and in the summer of uh, 1964, he also went to Mississippi to join the uh, the uh, the freedom the Mississippi Freedom Summer Project under the leadership of Fannie Lou Hamer and the Mississippi Democratic Freedom Party. So he stayed there for some time and also attended the. Uh, the, Denver, the National Democratic Convention in Atlantic City, New Jersey, as part of the delegation with the Mississippi Democratic Freedom Party. And eventually going back to Washington, D.C., he was involved in the anti-poverty program in 1965. In uh, 1966 and 67, he was involved, or you know, he was made the director in charge of the, the, the state of Alabama in terms of for SNCC in the Greene County um, the Green County Project, in which they were organizing the people to to so it's not not just to register to vote, but they were using the 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 idea of registering to vote as a tool for organization or for organizing people, and um and I think that's an important point to remember because often now we see that our, our politics have been reduced to uh you know to to just electoral politics and just voting saying you you know. You know, you're saying it's like vote blue no matter who and all this other stuff. And then they, they try to put it on those who are the pioneers in the struggle in order to 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 for people to quote unquote gain the right to vote. And they but they but they they really don't know how depoliticized they are. And they don't understand like what it means to to organize and be political and how much greater it is than the ballot box. But anyway, so they or they organize the people in order to be able to to, to uh, galvanize the people to be able to move in an act of self-determination. So he was heavily involved in that. And by the time 1967 comes, he becomes the chair of SNCC. So if you remember, he, um, he was the, the successor to Stokely Car Carmichael at the time, form, you know, eventually known as Kwame Touré. But Imam Jamil was the successor to him so he became the chair of SNCC in 1967. And, you know, some things happened to where, you know, um, you know, Imam Jamil was very involved in, in movement and very, um, you know, active in terms of bringing our community to a certain place. And also, we have to keep in mind that the, the, the United States government actually named a, a, a law after Imam Jamil. They call it the, the, the Rat Brown uh, uh, riot act of 1968. That's something that anyone, anyone can Google and see. And they actually named that law after him. Now, in 1971, he ended up being incarcerated in Attica in, in, in New York. He ended up being incarcerated. And what he was incarcerated for essentially was cleaning up the drug trade within the black community in New York City. You know, so he was incarcerated from 1971 to 1976. And in that process, he became, or in that time, he, he converted to Islam. He became, he went from H. Rock Brown to Imam Jamil al -Amin. Um, And now, so once he was released in 1976, he resettled in Atlanta. He moved to the, the West End of Atlanta, which is a community that, that was riddled with crime and, you know, and all kind of stuff, you know what I mean? But so what he did was it basically he created a community, a, a, a congregation of brothers and sisters, and he cleaned up the community. So when they cleaned up this community, a lot of the people that that previously didn't feel safe in the community were able to come out and you know, you know, live live normally, so to speak. You know, people that elderly people in particular that maybe one, at one point were scared to go out at certain times, or scared to walk to the store because of the activity in, in the neighborhood. You know, once he came in. And you know he cleaned up the neighborhood. It was it was it was safe at that point. And you know eventually, to kind of fast forward to where he's at now, he's currently in prison in Arizona, um, in USP, in, in Tucson, Arizona, 
on a charge of uh, shooting one Fulton County um, deputy and killing another. Now we have a confession by Otis Jackson. This is the same, this man has confessed when the crime happened and he's confessing up until this day. This man has been in prison, mind you, for something else for this entire time. But he's confessing and what we're trying to do, what our, what our campaign is trying to do, not only bring, of course, bring uh, uh, light to Imam Jabil's case, but also using his case to highlight other the cases of other political prisoners and our people who have been targeted since the days of COINTELPRO, and not that the days of COINTELPRO have, have ever really left us, but, you know, since the, I guess, the, the legacy days, so to speak, of COINTELPRO in the 60s and so forth. Um, so... Right now, we're really struggling to try to bring light to this case and try to bring some, um, you know, some, some bring either, either first and foremost to get him exonerated or to get him a new trial. So we're trying to educate people about who he is and what's going on and where they can find this information. If you go to imamjamilactionnetwork.org, you can find all the information on Imam Jamil. You can find the things that you can do to help. And, you know, if you go to the, the, the website, what happened to rap.com, what happened, the number two rap.com. And you can see a lot of the information on there as well. You also see the, the video, the video confession, one of the latest video confessions that Otis Jackson has made. I think it was in, in uh, 2019. Well, he was actually on court TV for another trial. And some of the questioning led, led it to be, led, led him to segue into confessing again to the crime that Imam Jamil has been committed convicted for. So as early as uh, uh, 2019, we have a video confession on court TV. And also, he's been confessing the whole time. And just recently, the Conviction Integrity Unit of Fulton County, Georgia, who has the power to exonerate Imam Jamil or to bring him another trial, they have actually went and interviewed Otis Jackson recently. So within the last month or so, he, they've interviewed him. So we're hoping that because of this interview, that means that eventually or soon, Imam Jamil will be released. No, we definitely <clears throat> need to get him released. Um, and if I can ask you too, um, so why is it important that we we fight for all our political prisoners, especially uh, you know, you, uh, Imam Jamil Alamin? Mean. Yeah. Well, it's important for one that I think we have to realize that um, I've heard I've heard someone saying that, and I have a tendency to agree with this that every essentially every black person in 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 the prison system in the United States is essentially a political prison. You know, now that don't mean that doesn't mean that they necessarily are a conscious politi political prisoner who made a decision to 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 do some type of act of liberation or some type of act of self-determination. But many of them are political prisoners due to economic situations. People go out here, you know, we know a lot of our people are in prison for drugs in one way, shape or form or another because they, you know, because of what, you know, uh, uh, you know, the systemic poverty that's created, just like the first video was showing down in Lowndes County, Alabama. You know what I'm saying? If you have people that are put in a, in a desperate situation like that, then they're going to do desperate things, you know, and especially if it's, it's something that we know that it's, it's systemic. It's not just, you know, these people are just making this choice. This choice is essentially being made for them. Now that doesn't, that doesn't remove the agency of choice from anybody, you know, because we have to be responsible too. At the same time, we can't be, we can't be these secondary predators on each other. You know what I'm saying? We can, we have to be responsible. We have to be accountable for ourselves because ultimately, if you're serious about liberation and you, you know that, that, you know, you have to have a certain level of, of discipline. You can't, you can't imitate your enemy or do the same thing that your enemy does and think that you can defeat them. You know, there's, there's saying one thing that Imam Jamil always says, he said, if you can't beat yourself, then you can't beat nobody else. So we have to, we have to understand this and really be serious, not only in our commitments, but in our personal lives as to how we want to win. How are you going to be the person that's going to win? So, you know, you can get, you know, they can come in and, you know, blow your chest out or something. But at the end of the day, if you are the right type of person, then 
it really don't matter because you win anyway. And, and if those people are duplicated, you know, like back back in, um, was in 1972 when they killed um, Fred Hampton and Mark Clark, you know, so when, you know, those type of people, they knew that if they, if they cut the head off, so to speak, the body would die. And that was their whole plan. People like, like I said, like Fred Hampton and Mark Clark, people like Mumi Abu Jamal, you know, they, they, people like Imam Jamil Alameen, you know, they look to, to, to try to, and they, and they have to some degree have had, have had a certain level of success and basically uh, arresting in the development of our movements by destroying our leadership. Malcolm X, you know, is another example. You know, of course, you know, Martin Luther King and so on and so forth. So we have to be, we have to look at ourselves in terms of, of, of a level of development to where it doesn't matter who they take out because everybody's that person. So when we get to that point, then, you know, it's a different, it's a different ball game. You know, you know, definitely uh yeah, appreciate that. Uh we definitely gotta highlight our political prisoners, you know, Dr. Matulu Shakur just got out. Absolutely, yes. Um, you know, Russell Maroon Short Schultz, he got out not too long right. ago and then unfortunately, you know, yeah, transition. Right. So it's definitely important. And uh yes. real quick, you know, real quick, I just got some other questions from the chat. One from uh Brother Munir. Um so just for um to be clear and so everybody knows uh how long how long has Imam uh Jamil Jamil Al Amin been incarcerated? And how he's, is he been, he's been incarcerated since uh since two thousand. So he's been down for now for twenty two years going up. It'll be twenty three years soon in March. Um Imam Jamil, right now his health is stable. You know, we had to have some campaigns uh early on because he was diagnosed with smoldering myeloma. Um which is a serious uh, blood disease. It leads to a certain type of blood cancer. Um, you know, he has some cataract problems to where at one point he was essentially blind because they were, they, they were, they were uh, withholding medical treatment for him. And we had to do a phone campaign and a writing campaign, an emailing campaign in order to get him medical treatment because what they do, what they were doing and what they do to many of our political prisoners is called execution by medical neglect. So when you look at someone like, for instance, like a Mumi Abu Jamal, or like a, 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 a Russell Schultz, who was, as you mentioned, who was recently re released and, and died, like Brother Mutulu Shakur, who was who was uh, chronically ill at this time, but just re recently re recently released. You know, yeah, these are these are um, things that we that are celebratory in terms of them being free, but at the same time, you know. Our goal is not for them to, to be free after they've been destroyed. You know what I'm saying? We want them out, you know, we want them out here now before, we, first of all, we don't want them to ever go because, you know, you know, they're, they're, you know, they're, they're within their right in terms of, you know, being political and being, as Imam Jamil calls himself, a prisoner at war. You know what I'm saying? So they're no different than these people that they honor or that they force upon the society, you know, they're, 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 um, you know, they're George Washington's and they're Christopher Columbus's and these, these people that we, that we know are oppressors that they force down our throats, so to speak, and make us, uh, not just, I'm saying this, the society in general, make them idols, so to speak, or make them heroes. And even though these people are our oppressors, you know, so I think that we have to, you know, we definitely have to, um, you know, be, you know, uh, mindful of all the political prisoners, Linda Peltier, you know, you know, even, even Assad Shakur being, a, you know, being a political exile, you know, it's people, people like that, you know, uh, and many other, you know, brothers and sisters who, who have fallen, who never, you know, who never lived long lives because they were executed by this government, you know, so we just have to keep it, um, you know, keep our, our, ourselves politically educated and pass on this information and continue to organize and, you know, try to raise their names and try to, you know, do the actions that we can in order to see them free. Well, definitely, yeah. No, well, definitely not unite with that. Appreciate that. And um, just got one more question from uh, Donna. And um, that's what 
if any type of repression does Imam Jamil and other Muslim prisoners face? I know you just said uh, you know, execution by uh, medical yeah. neglect, but is there any forms of repression that we see, like specifically targeted against other Muslims that Muslims mm -hmm. now are incarcerated? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, well, you know, when he was first incarcerated, um, you know, Imam Jamil, he was kept in solitary confinement. If I'm not mistaken, it was for the first seven years of his incarceration. So he was kept in solitary confinement and and also in um, in um, 20, 23 hour lockdown. So you can understand what that what that do that that's and and when you when you speak of the the UN and human rights. Those are things that are determined to be um, torture. And these are declarations that the United States, you know, are signatories to. So these are things that they, you know, they agree with, but that they actually commit themselves. You know what I'm saying? So we, we, we have to understand, like, like, in terms of, you know, just to kind of give you an example, when, when, when Imam Jamil was first, like, because Imam Jamil is being held in a federal facility. He's charged, he's convicted with a state crime, but he's held in a federal facility. So, you know, you have to ask yourself, like, why is it? Why would you take someone who committed, according to you, committed, is guilty of a state crime in the state of Georgia and have them housed in the federal penitentiary in Arizona? You know, that those types of things tell you something right there. You know, why is it that Imam Jamil has 44,000 pages of documents on him that was discovered through a Freedom of Information Act. This is just since, since he's been a Muslim in, you know, after, since he's been released from, from in 1976. So you have 44,000 pages of, of documents on him, um, you know, even though they claim that COINTELPRO is gone and things of this nature. Why is it that Imam Jamil was one of the people named um, by name from J. Edgar Hoover as one of the people that should be eliminated in terms of when they had the fear of a black, black Messiah. But just in terms of Muslims in general, there's been many, you know, many cases of, um, because many, many of these, many of these brothers and sisters who are our freedom fighters are, you know, either were Muslim or, or became Muslim at some point. And there's been different, um, you know, different uh, situations to where they've been not denied their ability to to practice their, their 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 way of life. You know, certain dietary restrictions that you know to where essentially you will give constantly give a person stuff to eat that they can't eat. You know what I'm saying? So you know, and you know, and they just you know refuse to eat eat you know or or have to or or have to resort to eating bare minimal and things of this nature. You know, so it's some it's some of those subtle things that are more so happening or that have happened that that are used as tactics because they don't they want they don't want to just do things out, outright they like you know they don't want to just you know you know you don't want to just go in the cell and just shoot somebody and say oh they you know this is what it is you know they like to they like to do things again like i mentioned about the execu execution by medical neglect that's not not only something that happened to imam jamil as we see with with the things that have been happening with mumia the things that have happened with mutula shakur the things that will happen with Harun uh, uh, Russell Schultz, you know, these all are, are essentially examples of execu execution by medical neglect. Oh, yeah, most definitely. Yeah, uh, no, I appreciate it. We appreciate you answering those questions and explaining that, and, uh, even dropping information on how we can get involved with friends, uh, Imam Jamil al -Amin. And, uh, you know, just got to keep continuing that push to free all our political prisoners and freedom fighters. Um, oh, yeah. So, yeah, we thank you and appreciate you again. Um, I appreciate you. Definitely. And then moving forward, we have another film called uh, Fannie Lou Hamer's America uh, Beyond the Lens that we're going to show as well. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine.
My mom used to always sing this little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. Her singing had an urgency about it, an urgency for people to listen, for people to know that they were working for a cause and everybody needed to join in because there was so much against the black people back then. My name is Jacqueline Hamer Flakes, and I'm the youngest and only living daughter of the late civil rights activist, Mrs. Fannie Lou Hamer. People have written books, they have made movies, they have done bios, but they really don't know the real Fannie Lou Hamer. We have been black, powerless people for 400 years. My name is Monica Land, and Fannie Lou Hamer was my great aunt. Her husband, Pap, and my maternal grandfather were brothers. One of the things that I saw that was missing in all of the documentaries and clips that I'd seen on Fa Aunt Fannie Lou was the family element, um, stories that I had been told and heard my entire life. Those were missing. That personal side of her life was missing, and I thought people needed to see that. Aunt Fannie Lou had always said was that she had spoken at every college and university campus there was. And once we started researching this film, we saw that that was just about true. She had a very large presence. I've been very concerned with young black people in Mississippi. And there's no need of getting an education, running to some other place. Fight and make it right here. I'd take a chance in Mississippi quicker than I would Chicago because we at least know where we are here. But they got some of the same hypocrites up there. It's just like these white racists down there. I just thought, you know, why not let her tell her own story? She was known, you know, for her public speaking. She was such a fiery speaker. I didn't come to Washington to hear no bills being legislated that they would feed me in 1972. What in the world is going on between 972? I'm thinking about what you going to do for my people in December. When she spoke before other people, she told them about her background, her history, the cotton fields, where she came from. And so it just seemed natural to just build that and let her tell her own existence. See, Mississippi is not actually Mississippi's problem. Mississippi is America's problem. My name is Jimmy Lee Lacey, and Aunt Fanny is my great aunt. She was the baby of, of the family. She believed truly uh, in God. To have a family was kind of a religious family, and, and, and you was going to do something in the church. If she was there, you were going to do something, whether it was sing, pray, preach, or whatever. It looked like everybody was quiet. And if there wasn't a preacher as a Sunday school teacher or a Sunday school superintendent, we all, we were brought up like that. But we was taught to love everybody, whether you was white or black. Uh, skin never made a difference with her when it come down to righteous or come down to being right. In the same way with, with wrong. If you're wrong, it didn't make no difference what color you were. If you were wrong, she told you you were wrong. If I hate you because you hate me, I'm no better than you are. And all we want to do is to make these people understand that we are human beings and we can work together. Long before she got involved in civil rights, she was saying, We are sick and tired of being sick and tired. We are tired of working for three measly dollars a day, going home and being too tired to cook what little we did have. Because she was. Picking cotton was such a chore. 
My mother picked cotton, and 50, 60 years later, she's still traumatized by seeing cotton fields. She hates to see them because of the drudgery that it was on them. And so Aunt Fannie Lou did this for so long. And so that saying just followed her all of her life. Her song moved people, it motivated people. The freedom songs that she sang, that's what she used, and she was good at it. Just think about going to a courthouse and just wanting to register to vote so that your name means something more than just having yourself being counted in the census, but just meaning something where you can vote for the president of the United States, vote for the people who are representing you in your city, in your county, in your state, in your nation. Just knowing that you have the power or you should have had the power. But it took her going to Indianola and walking up to the counter and saying, we're here to register to vote. She was out there uh, figuring a way how to make people live better. She wanted better for her children. She wanted better for her community. And I think that was the driving force, um, to just make things better for everyone, regardless of their color. Aunt Fannie Lou helped organize Freedom Summer. People should be expected to get beaten. They should expect to spend in jail and that they should expect possibly somebody to get killed. She marched with Dr. King. She spoke, uh, Malcolm X introduced her as America's number one freedom fighting woman. She felt the need um, with others, um, including Mrs. Ella Baker, to create the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party, or the MFDP. That a political party should be open to all the people who wish to subscribe to its principles. It, it, that was created because the official Democratic Party of Mississippi didn't allow black people to participate. In 1964, when Mama Fannie went before the Credentials Committee, she walked in there with her purse on her arms, and um, she, I'm gonna say she was only five feet four, but she was walking tall that day. And when it was time for her to speak, she said, Is this America? the land of the free and the home of the brave, where we have to sleep with our telephones off of the hook because our lives be threatened daily. And while she was speaking and telling about all the horrible things that were going on in the Mississippi Delta, um, President Lyndon B. Johnson um, did all that he could to make sure that it wasn't seen. They went to emergency um, commercials. He didn't know that that night it was aired anyway. And people all over the world saw that. They saw that she was telling what was going on. She wasn't fearful about telling what was going on because she went point A to point Z. And at the end, she had tears in her eyes. So that let everybody know that it was serious. She was a very, very important part of the Voting Rights Act of 1965. What drove her was hearing that black people could vote, you know, and have a say in what she called their destiny. Here they come, followers of the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party. They've been here at the House of Representatives all day long morning. They are all now under arrest, charged with unlawful occupancy of a public building. I realized who my mama Fannie Lou Hamer was when um, she took us on a trip with her to Atlanta, Georgia. 
and they had a convention going on, and I saw Mama on stage, and she had that hand on her hip, and her head was reared back, and she was talking, and she was giving the information on um, what happened to her in Winona when she was beaten. What happened to her in Winona, Mississippi changed her forever. I have a blood clot now in the artery to the left eye and a permanent kidney injury on the right side from that beating. As they were leaving the jail, they were told that Medgar Evers had been assassinated that morning. 15 minutes past midnight, Evers got out of his car beside his home in a Negro residential area. In a vacant lot about 40 yards away, a sniper fired a single shot from a high-powered rifle at Evers' silhouette. The bullet hit him in the back, crashed through his body, through a window into the house. He died within an hour at a Jackson hospital. She said later that um, that could have been what spared their lives because she'd heard the law enforcement uh, officials talking about killing them and throwing them in the Big Black River. But because Medgar Evers had been assassinated earlier that morning, all eyes were going to be on Mississippi, and it was going to be too much publicity to do that. And so she honestly believed that uh, the unfortunate death of Medgar Evers is what saved their lives. I've been beaten in jail till my body was hard as metal. My house was bombed January 28, 1971, but I'm not stopping. One of the things that, that moved me about her personality, her voice was so commanding. In 1963 or 1964, we didn't have many people registered in the Mississippi, but today we have 60% of the black population registered in Mississippi. We have 42 elected officials in the state of Mississippi, and one day you'll be proud when you can say, Senator Fannie Lou Hamer, because I'm on my way there. She said that you know, people may talk about me because they consider me uneducated, but still they were afraid of her because she had the power. We found all of these television interviews. Say, will you welcome please, Mrs. Fanny Lou Hamer. Where she was face to face with uh, older um, white politicians. She was not intimidated by them because they were educated, particularly when she knew what she was talking about. Even after the 19, 1965 voting rights bill passed and they sent a few registrars in Mississippi, they were able to get a few thousand people registered, but they are still is not accepted on the state book. And the only way these people can vote is on a national election. Well, how can they say they're fighting for the right for people to vote when we're not allowed to vote in the state of Mississippi? You've got a good point there, but... That was amazing for me to see, that you had these old politicians who had been in politics for years with this woman that came out of the cotton field and told them where to go. You know, it's, it's, it's both funny and amazing at the same time that she had that kind of power, she had that kind of presence. In the state of Mississippi, and we are tired of people saying that we are satisfied. It was so effective. Dr. Martin Luther King did not like to follow her on stage because she was so dramatic. Hera Belifonte uh, raised the money that sent her and several other SNCC delegates to Africa to visit President Sekou Tori. Mr. Harry Belafonte's wife, Julie, uh, was with her. And Mama Fanny was amazed by the things that she saw in Ghana. Black people working in the bank, running the bank, running the stores, you know, people, um, the president came to the hotel where they were, and uh, Miss Julie came up to the hotel room, and she was like, Fanny, the president is here to see you. And Mom was like, no, uh -uh, I'm not going down there. I got rollers in my hair. So Miss Belafonte and, and, and her family, they all laugh about that because uh, Mama was family to them. Whenever she was in New York, she stayed in their home. 
the picture that I saw that uh, made me know that I'm gonna say mama is famous um, was a picture of um, the Kennedys. And I said, mama, who is that lady? She's, she's pretty. And she said, that's your God mama. And I'm like, my God mama? And she said, that's Jacqueline Kennedy. And I'm like, oh. Now, I don't know if she was just saying that to make me feel good, but <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm still, I'm still hang, uh, hanging on that story. That's my God mama. She had this best friend, Miss Rose, and she would write letters to Miss Rose where she's uh, really just um, being a mother and being a friend. This is a letter that Mama wrote on October 13th, 1965. Dear Rose, I received the package today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Rose, I've been very sick. Also, my husband. He stayed in the hospital 14 days and nights with a slip disc. It's also corrupted. But he's up now, not well, but better. And I am better. Thank God. The children are fine. They're in school. I hope all your family are fine. Rose, my daughter that's 21 is going to be a mother in November. If you can find any used baby clothes, please send them to me, Rose. Rose, I met a wonderful lady in Portland. She knew you. I told her you are a mother for me, although I'm the oldest. I thank God there are people like you who care. Last night, we watched two cars stop in front of the house with white people in them. We saw one fella get out and a white girl. We don't know why they stopped because there are no white people on this street. Who do we report this to? Nobody have, nobody have been convicted. That's what made me question America. How can we say this is a free country when all this can happen? Oh, God, I wonder how long. Well, I have to tell you, as you're one of the greatest friends I ever had, answer soon, yours for God and for justice, Fannie Lou Hamer. When um, our lead researcher and consultant, um, Dr. Megan Parker Brooks, found the letters and I started reading the letters, it was just so sad because she really poured out her heart to her friend Rose Fishman. And it was almost like seeing two different people. You saw the person, you know, who motivated the crowd and got people to go register and vote and the person who was shot at and all of that. But then in the letters, you see a woman. You see a mother, a wife, a friend, and all of the baggage that came with that. This is another letter that Mama Fanny wrote to Mrs. Edgar E. Smith, and this is a person in Massachusetts that she knew. Dear Mrs. Smith, this is to assure you that your letters and checks and also all the boxes Ms. Smith, the money was so much help, I've been sick again and couldn't have gone to see a doctor. If you, if you all hadn't helped me, I just wish I could put it in writing how I feel about what you all are doing for us. It makes my heart feel so good. Mrs. Smith, I've lasted a long time behind the beating. I got in jail, but it is catching up with me now. My whole body sometimes is sore. But I'm going to work until my days are done. Thank you all for everything. You're for God and justice for men. Mrs. Fannie Lou Hamer. She had just tremendous health issues. And when she was told that she had a tumor and needed to have it removed during the procedure, a white doctor performed a hysterectomy on her without her knowledge or consent. And apparently at the time, a very common practice, and it was termed a Mississippi appendectomy. How can you do that? But that's what they were dealing with back then in the 50s and the 60s. When I think about those things, I, I really get angry. I get angry because she worked hard. She worked tirelessly. And I mean, when she was diagnosed with uh, breast cancer, and it was already in a late stage when she found out. She would tell me, Cookie, 
come on in here, baby, and lay down by mama. I'm cold. And back then, I didn't know what she was really doing. But the last, last few days of her being in the hospital in Mount Bayou, Daddy Pap took us to see her. And we started walking in the room. Me and my sister started walking in the room. And she started screaming, get him out of here. Get him out of here. She didn't want us to see her like that. So my memory is not of someone who's frail or anything like that because she never, she never let us see her at that point. But my memory is, Cookie Baby, come on in here. Get in the bed with Mama. Just thinking about her. Loving and caring for four daughters of which she didn't give birth to any. But she loved us, and she took care of us. Every time I come out here, I can just feel her spirit. We won't determine some of our destiny, and this is what black power means. She is such a tremendous part of our history. It's so sad to me in all that she accomplished and tried to accomplish, most people don't even know who she is. We take for granted being able to walk in the front door of a grocery store, being able to go in any grocery store. We take for granted being able to go to the schools of our choice. We take for granted being able to eat anywhere we want, sit anywhere on the bus, drink at any water fountain. Those are things that she and so many others fought for and died for. And so because her sacrifices were so great and she died the way that she did, and she is such a part of history, I would just like to see her recognized for what she did and for the sacrifices that she made for this effort. We want people all over America to know that we fighting on a principle. And we gonna say, and we gonna say now, go and tell it on the mountain. Great. It was definitely a, a power, powerful video. You know, long live St. Lou Hamer. Um, yeah, next up, we have uh, Lucy Mur Murphy. Um, Lucy Murphy is a cultural warrior from Washington, D.C., uh, whose insights are informed by the movements and folkways of people across the globe. Lucy Murphy has also traveled to Lebanon to observe some of the Palestinian refugee camps to China before they uh, normalized ties with the United States, and is also to Cuba to oppose U.S. travel restrictions. Um, so a great freedom fighter that we got today, uh, and Lucy Murphy. I also had the pleasure of hearing Lucy Murphy sing down here in Greenville when we had to drop the charges uh, rally for day dawn. So uh, we appreciate you. Uh, it's all yours. We who believe in justice cannot rest. Cannot rest. We who believe in justice cannot rest until it comes. We who believe in justice cannot rest. 
turned out rest. Oh no, we who believe in justice cannot rest until it comes. Until the killing of black men, black mother's sons, is as important as the killing of white men, white mother's sons. We who believe in justice cannot rest. Justice cannot rest. We who believe in justice cannot rest until it comes. We me young people come first. They come first. They have the courage where we failed. If I can shed some light as they follow us through the gale. We who believe in we justice, who believe cannot, in justice rest, cannot rest. We who believe in justice cannot rest until it comes. And that which touches me most is that I had a chance to work with people, work with passing people. on to others mm -hmm. that which was passed Best. on to me. We who believe in the justice cannot rest, cannot rest. We who believe in justice cannot rest until it comes. The older I get, the better I know that the secret of my going on, going on. is when the reins are in the hands of the young who dare to run against the storm. We who believe in justice cannot rest, cannot rest. We who believe in justice cannot rest until it comes. Struggling myself don't mean a whole lot. I've come to realize, realize that teaching others to stand and fight is the only way our struggle survives. We who believe in justice cannot rest. Justice cannot rest. We who believe in justice cannot rest until it comes. Not needing to clutch for power, not needing the light just to shine on me. Not shine on I need me. to be just one in the number as we stand against tyranny. We who believe in we justice who believe in cannot rest. rest. Is, cannot rest. We who believe in justice cannot rest until it comes. I'm a woman who speaks in a voice and I must be heard. Sometimes I am quite difficult. I bow to no man's word. We who believe in justice, believe in cannot, justice rest, cannot rest. We who believe in justice cannot rest until it comes. We who believe in justice cannot rest, cannot rest. We who believe in justice cannot rest until it comes. I want to thank uh, Dana, Dana Al Hassan, for uh, stepping in at the last minute and being able to pick up the um, the videos and and project them uh, just like she was ready to do it all along. Um, like to thank uh, the two people who sang with me, Eric Sheptock. Uh, who in D.C., we call him the mayor of the homeless, and uh, Dr. Karen Wilson Ama Achefu, who's a wonderful storyteller, who uh, helped me with the, uh, with the harmony there on um, Ella's song. And um, because freedom is, uh, the, the, the meaning has been so twisted, uh, you know, the free market, and this is a free country and uh, so many other um, hypocrisies. 
we decided to change the words a little from we who believe in freedom to we who believe in justice, because uh, the word justice is a little, um, little better defined these days. Um, and I'm representing the uh, committee to uh, release COINTELPRO and uh, support HR 2998. Um, and I'd like to say, as the Supreme Court declared in 1857, that the black man has no rights that a white man was bound to respect, we continue to see that the right to self-defense, self-preservation, and protection of our vulnerable family members is not respected by agents of the state. The agents of the state may be police, may be corrections, may be social service workers or political office holders. They do not behave in a manner to protect and serve black people. Even though the tax revenue from black people pays their salaries. Those who organize to demand human rights are called thugs and terrorists, and they are targeted for arrest and assassination. And uh, the pro program was called COINTELPRO, which stands for Counterintelligence Program. In the 50s and 60s, it targeted racial justice groups women's rights groups, and anti-war organizations. They say that it ended in 1971, but the practices continue. Black Panther Party member turned Congressman Bobby Rush of Illinois has offered a bill to force the release of the files to show the extent of the program's illegal activities. The purpose is to arm the public with full knowledge of these illegal practices so that the public can pressure for a change in government practices from genocide to respect for human rights. I'm going to ask uh, Dana to project uh, the link that individuals can use. It's a, a link from uh, justiceforall.org, justiceforall.org. O -R -G. Um, individuals can use this link to call their representatives uh, because these representatives are responsible to us, uh, even though it may not seem that they are. They are paid by us and they are responsible to us. Um, and uh, we want them to stand up against the injustices and transgressions of the past, to stop their reiteration in the present and future. Um, and as I said before, HR 2998, COINTELPRO, Full Disclosure Act, was introduced in the US House of Representatives by Congressman Bobby Rush in May 2021, the act would require the US government to release and publicly disclose in six months all records related to the FBI's COINTELPRO operations. And we need you to ask your representatives in Congress to sign on to the bill. Um, individuals can use this link to call their representatives. And uh, that's it for me. Brother Ascari. Yes, no, we appreciate that. And, um, and so, why is it, oh, Donna, my bad. Can you uh, give me permission to share my video again? No, oh, while she's doing that. So, um, why is it important that we, um, that we stand up and kind of like, you know, fight against COINTELPRO? Well, because 
people who are defending our rights are being attacked by COINTELPRO and COINTELPRO type tactics. So we need to uh, we need to defend the people who are defending us. Most definitely, most definitely. I, I, I unite with that and I agree with you. I think it's important as well that we, we understand, you know. Um, and I know, I know some people don't know who their representative in Congress is, who their senator is, but these people are responsible to you. Um, legally, they may not act like it, but legally they are responsible to you. And the form that um, Dana projected uh, will take you, um, it takes your address and tells you who your representative is, if you don't know. And you can contact that person by telephone, by uh, email, because their telephone and their email is public. It's available to all of us. And even though they may not pick up the phone, they have plenty of people in their office who know how to pick up the phone and take a message, or they have a, a, a voicemail that will take your uh, name and address. And, uh, and so they understand that they are responsible to you. You are their constituent. And um, they need to listen to you if you tell them this is a bill uh, that you want them to support. Yes, we appreciate that. Actually, I got one more question for you in the chat, too, from Donna. And just uh, reflecting on Day Don's and Denisha's cases, why is it now so important to uh, support release of uh, COINTELPRO? Well, obviously, the COINTELPRO tactics were used against them. Yeah. And so uh, we need to make more people aware that these, these, uh, this misbehavior, this illegal behavior on the part of people whose salaries we pay. I mean, you know, their salary comes out of our taxes. Most definitely, well, definitely, definitely unite with you. Just Lucy, I think, is uh, super important, you know, especially uh, what we see right now is uh, one of the primary contradictions is America would rather allow neo-Nazis and uh, just overt fascists to roam the streets and things of that nature because that's what America is built off of. But, in, you know, just targeting our freedom fighters, our black freedom fighters, we've seen, like was mentioned earlier by our brother Ibrahim, uh, Brad Hampton, Mark Clark assassinated, you know what I'm saying, by the FBI, local police, uh, just things of this nature. So, yeah, I, I definitely unite with you and we appreciate you for this information and the resources that you provided. The, the history is uh, is full of thievery and murder, but we need to change it. If we want, you know, we need to build a future that is different from our past. Most different. Most different. That's all I have. I think that was all the questions from the chat as well. Again, we appreciate you, Ms. Lucy. And I want to give a shout out to Black Power Media and to all our panelists. We appreciate y'all. Thank y'all. Oh, um, yo, happy Kwanzaa. And in Swahili, we say tutu o nana badaye. You know, that's see you later. Uh, yeah, so appreciate y'all. You know, revolutionary love.
can tell it to the world about the tree of life. We come from the distant On behalf of the Imam Jamil Action Network, IJAN, and the rest of the Freedom Fighters Film Festival team, Brother Kalanji Changa of Black Power Media, Panic, Transform Alabama, the Crescent Community Center, Bar None by Design, Action Alliance, Jamatul Asr, Ubuntu Institute, the Malcolm X Center for Self-Determination, Muslims for Social Justice and Mapinduzi, we thank you for joining us. Tomorrow, on the fifth day of Kwanzaa, Nia, or Purpose, we will join Jamatul Asr and Action Alliance in Acadia, Florida at 5 p.m. Don't forget to join us the rest of Kwanzaa, either in person or on Black Power Media's YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram channels. To contact the Imam Jamil Action Network, www.imamjamilactionnetwork.org or call 1-833-999-IJAN. Thank you.